before we go to the prayer of illumination and the reading of scripture, I have a little intro that I think you need to set the stage to understand where we are in this book of 1 Samuel. I want to give you kind of like the backstory a little bit. So David had been anointed king, perhaps you remember, a couple of times earlier in this book of 1 Samuel, but he's still not on the throne. That hasn't happened yet in this narrative that we follow. At this particular point in time, he's roaming the land with a band of men robbing communities of food and other commodities. He's flexing his power and authority, but it appears like he's building himself a reputation of being more like a thug than a king at this moment. He and his men are hungry, and when they see the feasting at the sheep shearing event of Nabal, they can easily see a great abundance of food and drink. Now, Nabal owns 3,000 sheep and 3,000 goats, and all of the infrastructure that goes along with that, the shepherds, the sheep shearers, the land, David sends word, and makes, he sends word with one of Nabal's shepherds, demanding food and drink for his men. The message makes it very clear to Nabal that he and his men have not harmed any of Nabal's shepherds when they've been out in the wilderness. Matter of fact, they've protected them. They've formed a wall of protection night and day around his shepherds. David is insinuating that if Nabal wants that protection to continue, he needs to feed David and his men. It sounds to me a little like a threat from the mafia. Nabal's response, you might imagine, is described later in what Dan will read as screaming at the messenger. You know, don't shoot the messenger. Well, he's screaming back at the messenger, and he's basically saying, why should I set aside food for David and his men? What does, who does David think he is? I'm not going to offer hospitality to the likes of him. No way. Now, I'm not sure he was the type to offer hospitality to anybody, actually, but when David hears of Nabal's answer, his response is to get ready for battle. He is ready to fight. He plans to wipe out Nabal and all the males in his household. So now, one of Nabal's servants seeks out Abigail, who is Nabal's wife. He knows David is serious about this planning to gird up all the men and come after Nabal and his men. He's plundered other cities before with his band of marauders. And so this shepherd or this servant has gone and tries to speak to Abigail to plead for some change. So we enter now this text in 1 Samuel as the narrator describes what I would call a very tense situation. Let us pray and listen. Open our hearts and our minds to listen to your word for us today. Speak, Lord, and help your servants to listen. To Abigail, wife of Nabal, one of the boys reported, Look, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our Lord, and he screamed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not put to shame. And we never missed anything all the days we were with them when we were in the field. They were a wall to us, even by night and also every day. We were with them, keeping the sheep. Now know this and see what you can do. For evil against our master and against all his house has been resolved. He is worthless. No one can speak to him. Then Abigail hurried, and she took 200 loaves, two skins of wine, five prepared sheep, five measures of parched grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 fig cakes, and she loaded them on donkeys. And Abigail said to her boys, Go on before me, I am coming after you. And her, hus and her husband Nabal, Nabal, she did not tell. 
And Abigail saw David, and she hurried and got down from the donkey, fell before David on her face, bowing to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my lord, the iniquity. Please let your slave woman speak in your ears and hear the words of your slave. Please, my lord, do not set your thought on this worthless man Nabal, Nabal for, as his name is, for as is his name, this is he. Nabal, meaning disgrace, is his name, and he is a disgrace. Now I, your slave, did not see my lord's boys whom you sent. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Holy One, the God of Israel, who sent you to meet me today. Blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you, who have kept me today from coming for blood and saving me from my own hand. Surely as the Holy One, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by the light of daybreak there would not have been left to, to Nabal anyone urinating against a wall. Later, after Nabal's death, Abigail hurried up, hurried and got up and mounted a donkey with five of her girls at her heels. She went after the messengers of David, and she became his wife. David also married Hinoam of Jezreel. Both of them became his wives. This is the word of the Lord. Dan and I had a little discussion this morning about that little phrase, um, all of those who urinate against a wall. <laughs> um, so that's not the women who do that. Uh, so basically it's a way to say all the men in your household are going to be demolished. There's going to be nobody left to urinate against a wall. So um, very graphic, I guess you would say. <clears throat> so sometimes you know and you would define an interruption as something rude and something unthinking by the person who's doing the interrupting. Sometimes interruptions are just a bother or an annoyance if they get in your way. Sometimes interruptions are needed when an interruption is called for, when an interruption can bring needed change to the continuity or the unity of a harmful or threatening condition, a, a process or a course of events, I would call that a good interruption. Being a good interrupter takes some courage take some creativity and some cleverness. Being a good interrupter takes risk, and it carries risk with it. A good interrupter is an interrupter who intervenes to upend some potential threat of violence or harm, one who speaks up with a desire to change the trajectory of events or plans, or actions of an individual, or an organization, or a community, or a system that has gone awry in some way. Abigail is the wife of Nabal, we have heard. Nabal is described by his wealth and his expansive property. He is called foolish. His name can actually be translated either fool or disgrace. His selfishness and surliness made him ugly. No one wanted to deal with him. Abigail, on the other hand, is described earlier in the chapter as clever and beautiful. She doesn't allow Nabal's behavior to define her. She acts independently, and we heard apparently even behind Nabal's back. As the wife of a very wealthy man, Abigail has the power to order servants to gather up an immense load of food to feed David and his men. She's smart, and she acts quickly. Time is of the essence in this situation. 
Abigail knows that giving David what he asked for will interrupt the execution of his murderous plan. She may not like being around her rude and selfish husband, but she definitely wants to protect the males of the household. She wants to keep her community safe. She's a good interrupter. And in the end, after God smites Nabal in his selfish orgy celebrating his great wealth at the sheep, sheep shearing festival, David ends up making her his wife, one of them. It might sound kind of like a fairy tale as you read through this chapter where the bad guy gets it in the end and the woman is the heroine who saves the community and gets the prize of marrying the guy who ends up being the king. But the story is a whole lot more than a fairy tale. It gives us an example of God at work through a courageous interrupter. A courageous, clever, creative interrupter who is female. Even though she's a woman, Abigail gets awe and respect from the narrator telling this story. Her story gets told again and again throughout the history of the people of Israel. And her story serves as a model for us today. When she finds out what's going on, she hurries to interrupt. Before David, she eloquently makes her case, insisting that David ignore Nabal and his foolishness. Instead, that he received these gifts of food and drink that she had brought. She's basically saying to David, Nabal's not worth your thinking about. It's not worth your time. And doing this action is not worth making your reputation as a murderer. David sees and interprets her action and her words as divinely inspired. He believes God sent Abigail to him. God sent Abigail to interrupt the violent bloodshed that was being threatened. He's able to see Abigail as a good interrupter and immediately calls a halt to all the battle preparations and does not go through with his plan. Now, Nabal does get smitten by God and dies pretty quickly afterward, but it wasn't at David's hand. So think a minute today. Who do you know who is a good interrupter? I think about the work being done by the safe streets workers in Baltimore here. The staff members of Safe Streets are called violence interrupters. Their goal is to watch on the streets for escalating conflict between anyone and to step in and interrupt it, de-escalate it, keep it from turning into a deadly shootout. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all of his co-workers in the civil rights struggles of the 1960s in this country were good interrupters. They were interrupters of an unjust system of laws which treated people of color as inferior to those with white skin. King advocates for interrupting more than just the laws and the lending practices. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here, which was written in 1967, just a few months before his murder, in that book, he challenges us all to see that the way to interrupt or disrupt systems of racial injustice is through the heart. He writes, 
the ultimate solution to the race problem lies in the willingness of men and women to obey the unenforceable. Not just the laws on the books, not just what the government says, but the things that can't be enforced. He says desegregation will break down the legal barriers and bring people together physically, but something must touch the hearts and souls of people. True integration will be achieved by those who are willingly obedient to the unenforceable obligation. Surely he means the unenforceable moral and spiritual obligations that we have to God, to one another, and to our very selves. The kinds of things that interrupt old patterns of thinking and believing which perpetuate racial just injustice. Attitudes or belief systems cannot be enforced from the outside, only from the heart. As a group, this summer has worked through the book Faithful Anti-Racism by Christina Edmondson and Chad Brennan. We've been challenged throughout the chapters to take action. The authors have called us to be disruptors of the forces which continue to perpetuate racial injustice. And they name religious forces, political forces, and economic forces. Not each of us individually to be a disruptor or interrupter, but to work together. There are a myriad of ways that we can be that kind of disruptor or a good interrupter of a harmful, centuries-old status quo in this country. What if we skipped ordering from Amazon? I know that is so easy. And what if we made it a point to investigate and learn about the black-owned businesses in Baltimore and used our dollars there? Has any of you ever tried the Taharka Brothers ice cream? Born in Baltimore, fantastic flavor combinations, perfect on a summer day. Find a place where they sell it. It's in multiple places around the city and support a Baltimore black owned business, Taharka Brothers ice cream. What if we gave our time and attention to the children at the Katherine Johnson Global Academy in the Rosemont community? Not just once or twice, but frequently enough to build a relationship of trust with a student where you can laugh together and learn together. In a primarily African-American school which struggles with academic progress, your presence could broaden understanding of other cultures if your home is not the United States. In that same school, you could break down stereotypes if you are white. And in that same school, you could encourage children to reach for the sky if you personally have experiences of a career and life experiences as an African American here in Baltimore, Maryland. Check in with Jill Harrison, she's upstairs, or Joan Higby, she's downstairs to learn about the Monday afternoon enrichment time at the school that'll be starting up this fall, or the potential for a field trip to the Harriet Tubman Museum on the Eastern Shore, and other ways to plug in. So what if the next time you left your home and went to a new place, 
you intentionally looked for a neighborhood that needs diversity, a neighborhood that needs interrupting, no matter what it's like right now, that it needs interrupting. So it's not all black or not all white or not all Hispanic. Can you be a good interrupter of this pattern of housing segregation that runs so, so deep in the Baltimore region? What if you joined a new prayer movement in Baltimore, composed of people all over the city from all different kinds of faith expressions and practices who commit to one hour a month to pray for Baltimore? That group is trying to create a canopy of prayer over our city that will be 24-7 every day of the month. We're trying to get together a team who will continue to pray for one hour each month. We're looking at the third Tuesday. You pick the hour that works for you, middle of the night, early morning, middle day, or evening. Beginning in September, we'll make a commitment to pray at that time on that day each month. Let me know if you want to be involved and we'll get your name on our schedule. You see, prayer is a factor in interrupting the culture of violence. And even more so when the prayer is shared and spread to people all over the city in homes at all times of the day or with groups at different times of the day. Pray Baltimore 24-7, it is called. Let's commit to finding a way to be good interrupters somewhere. Amen. Thank you.